Hello, and welcome back to another fun-filled episode of the Hammercast. I am your host, Alex, the Hebrew Hammer Salkin, and today I am joined by a man named Moran, Mike Moran, <laughs> to be more specific. You like that? I came up with that That's good. just as you were adjusting your blinds to keep the sun under your face. Um, Mike is a personal trainer at one of the best gyms in the entire state of Arizona, maybe the entire United States. Right. I'll let him tell you about this a little bit. Um, And he is an enthusiast of uh, basically all the same stuff I am when it comes to training. Kettlebells, body weight, original strength, and uh, just generally crushing weakness and being awesome. So we're going to talk a bit about his transformation from his previous career to becoming a uh, crusher of weakness and a teacher of strength. As well as some of the uh, some of the experiences he's had with with my programs, uh, and he's done quite a few of them. He's a real veteran. He's a hammer veteran. So we're going to get uh, some good details from there. Uh, before we get started, one quick thing I want to make sure I mention is uh, I have a an email list, and it is a daily email list where all my best and brightest, top shelf grade A material goes out on the daily, and not on Facebook. Not on YouTube, although I do post in both of these places and other social media places. I reserve all my best info for my email list. And if you are not on it, you have made an incalculable error, but I can forgive you and uh, we can absolve you of that sin by, uh, by joining. And uh, I, there is a great book that I have that's not going to be available for free for much longer. It's my 99 Body Weight and Kettlebells Workout book. And uh, it's going to be turned into a paid product soon because I realized that there's just so much information jam packed in there that uh, I, I just couldn't leave it for free for too much longer. But I am coming up with a brand new and actually Mike is going to get uh, one of the first looks at this because I'm going to send it to him after the show. My nine minute body weight strength challenge ebook. It's going to be a free ebook and will also get you onto my email list. So if you are listening to this in the near future, uh, that will be the thing to help you to jump in. And I've got some stuff in there that I, I don't want to say it's revolutionary because I mean, it's stuff that, that a, a lot of people already know about, not everybody, but a lot of people, but what it will do for your strength is going to be pretty revolutionary. And you're not going to need uh, a darn bit of equipment to do it. It's the nine minute body weight strength challenge coming out very soon. Uh, there will be a link in the description so you can check that out. But in the meantime, the link will be to my 99 body weight and kettlebell workouts book. So be sure to climb aboard, whichever one it may be by the time you are listening. So without further ado, Mike, thank you for being on the show. Thanks for inviting me, Alex. This is going to be fun. Absolutely. Uh, I've known Mike for a good couple of years now. I remember we had a good chat. This must have been probably like early 2018. I don't know if you remember this. This was like like a FaceTime chat, like a long time ago. And uh, and that was a good old time. And uh, you have been keeping up with... uh, I've been keeping up with you and I've been seeing that you've got a lot of great material going out there for stuff that you've been doing with original strength. Uh, you put out some really great uh, tips and pointers and stuff like that on, on Facebook and uh, on Instagram and other places like that. And, uh, and you, you have an interesting story as we were talking about a little bit before is, is you got into personal training. That wasn't your first career, meaning it wasn't like, no, uh, no, not at all. <laughs> to be a personal trainer. And so tell us about that. What did you start off doing? Uh, so I'll try to give you the, the truncated story. So I had been, I've had a, a bevy of careers, an artist, tried to break into art. I was a musician. I tried to break into art that didn't, well, I did, but then the pay was abysmal right. and I was always good with computers and I got a job doing IT and that paid good. And I, I was able to work IT and put my wife through school so she could get her degree in education. And at some point in the low of the year of 2006, 2007, I was approaching my 30th birthday and I was huge. I was very overweight. Uh, I smoked. I ate like a jerk. And then my brother um, calls me up and says, hey, my father-in-law is going to start teaching Kyokushin Kai at the church. Do you want to come check it out? Kyokushin Kai is a full contact uh, karate. And I was like, oh yeah, that sounds great. I had done judo in high school. Mm-hmm. Um, karate had always interested me. I said, that that sounds good. And I went and I got destroyed. Destroyed. But it woke something up. I felt amazing. I mean, I hurt like hell, but I felt amazing. And I kept going back. And um, slowly, uh, that particular venue um, 
the the sensei there his time was getting eaten up with other things he couldn't teach as much and um in my frustration i went and looked for another school and i ended up finding um another gentleman sensei ralph rhodes who had been teaching and learning kyokushin through the late 60s and 70s but then he had moved on with his uh friend ninomiya Joko Ninomiya, who's now the founder of Enshin Karate, they had moved on to Ashihara, and then Ninomiya founded Enshin Karate, which is like a hybrid of Kyokushin Kai and Judo techniques, still hard, hard fighting, hard sparring, full contact, but with more takedowns. I found him and started training with him, and that was a lot of fun, and that just pushed me to get better, so the karate was making me want to be better, faster, stronger, and a friend of mine that I met said, oh man, you should, you should check out kettlebells. These things are awesome, and this was in 2008. I had been doing Kyokushin Kai and Enshin for maybe about a year. And um, I was like, cool. So I bought, I've, I looked up kettlebells. I found the RKC. I bought Enter the Kettlebell and I bought a kettlebell and I started to learn from the book. And I thought, you know, I should probably check out one of these instructors before I hurt myself, right? Because <laughs> I wasn't naturally gifted at some of this stuff. And I found, um, looking up in Tucson, I found Danny Sawaya. At the time, the, his gym was called, um, evolution fitness and i went and and worked with him and uh that one session made me want to be a trainer i was like i don't want to do it anymore this is really cool like he's helped me so much and over the course of years i um i kept training i've graded third degree in ancient karate third degree black belt um, I trained with Danny. I went through the Strong First Kettlebell certification and strong the Strong First Kettlebell cert or the Strong First World led me to original strength. And I flew out there and, and met Tim and Jeff and Danielle and did their certification and worked my way up to being an instructor under Tim through original strength. It's just been like a daisy chain of, of cool things, but it was all because I found something that really woke me up from that. I don't know. I was just on I was on autopilot of weakness or something. And uh, and then over the years, I had followed, I think I one of your first articles in Strong First, the Strong First blog, and I started following your stuff. And I was like, I like this guy. I like his approach. I, you know, similar thing you talked about, martial arts and kettlebells and calisthenics. And I liked all those things. So I always kept tabs on what's Alex doing? What's Alex doing? Um, and so when you had like your, your your inner circle and the Hebrew hammer, you know, I jumped on to check that stuff out and it's been a good time. But yeah, that's the kind of the short version of the story. That's a great. So version. I went, and yeah, I, I went from being even... like 298 pounds to now walking around about 190, 194, depending on time of year. That's amazing, man. That is huge. I mean, I think a lot of people don't realize how much uh, like just constant effort and patience and discipline and focus it takes to go from such an extreme to another. I mean, you're not really at an extreme right now, but like, you know, to go from being close to 300 pounds to being like a lean, mean fighting machine, literally, that's uh, that's a pretty. Yeah. And I uh, started I started jujitsu about a year ago, but there was like the shutdown. So I've switched. I. I've switched arts now because I'm learning how to fight on the ground. I just needed something different to do. <laughs> and it's a whole different, whole different hurting kind of game. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's interesting, too, because uh, as you were telling the story, this is the first time I've heard most of the story even. And, and it surprises me just how closely, even to, down to like dates, uh, that our our journeys were beginning on, on different sides of the country. Because in 2006, right. I started doing Muay Thai and I sucked at it, man. Like I did a, a like a, a complimentary class with a place here in Omaha. And the guy who uh, the guy who owns the school, Mick Doyle, was like a two time kickboxing world champion. He was uh, he came in second place in the Sabaki Open, which you probably know about. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's so the Asian tournament. Yeah. Okay. I, pro I probably I have a bunch of the videos. I probably have it. You might <laughs> you might see it. Uh, he goes by Michael Doyle in the in the um, okay in the video. But I I looked it up. I was like, dang, dude, this guy's like, you know, I I only saw the, that video recently. I but I knew about this like back then. And and I had this friend who was like, he and I watched the movie Ong Bak, the Thai warrior. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I love and, that movie. And we like we loved it. And so he found out that there was a place in Omaha that taught it. So we went and did this class. I was like nineteen. And like, I just got my butt handed to me because we were doing stuff like we would have to like bunny hop up a hill, like outside of his, uh, which is like, you know, you're crouching down mm -hmm. like, on, on the balls of your feet and jumping up a hill. Dude, I hurt for like a long time. And I was like, I think I need to sign up for this. This was amazing. Um, and, you know, and then I, I ended up doing Muay Thai for a while. I did Krav Maga. 
And in similarly, in, two, in similarly in 2008, a friend of mine introduced me to kettlebells, and um, you know, it was like from there I just I fell in love. And it was only like two years later that I would decide to become a uh, uh, an instructor. So in 2010, but uh, but yeah, it's funny how things like that happen. You know, like you get you get now you stuck with the martial arts for much longer than I did because you're a third degree black belt. And I, I never obtained any belt and pretty much anything, but, um, but loved the martial arts nonetheless. And, uh, and I got to ask, how do you manage to fit that all into your, into your schedule? Because that seems like, you know, martial arts training and then personal training and then lifting yourself. Um, you know? Yeah. The luckily personal training, um, you can set your own schedule mm-hmm. and uh, like, so my priorities, my, my family, so my income, so the martial arts kind of come second. So right now with jujitsu, um, I'm only making one or two classes a week when I can fit it in. At the time with Enshin, it was, I got first degree black belt. And then a month later, my wife was pregnant with our first kid. Um, and that changed some of my training. I had to, I had to train a lot more at home, but I think once you hit first degree, training yourself is a little bit easier because you've got um a good enough hold on the basics that you can hone things and uh i would you know i would watch videos and study fights and train at home on my heavy bag and stuff and then i would make it instead of going three or four nights a week i was only going two to three times a week but i would stay extra like on saturdays if i went i would stay an extra hour and spar with the guys if i could um and then now i mean luckily working at the best gym in tucson uh when i'm training clients when i have a gap in my schedule i'm like oh there's an hour there's where i'm going to train and uh, i get my training in uh my own strength training in and then um the cool part is and you probably i don't know when you were doing personal training or if you've ever done training clients in person i get a lot of original strength resets while i'm training them because i'm teaching them so at the same time so i'm resetting like 50 times a day sometimes (laughs) dude i had you know i gotta tell you i had like the ultimate um experience with that because when i lived in israel for basically for four years i trained people like in their homes so i would have to not only was i walking like usually a minimum of four miles a day just as a matter of course you know not like got to get my steps in. It was just like, I had no right, choice. It was just your day. Yeah. Um, I would, uh, but I, yeah, I had to, I, I, most of the people that I trained actually came from physical therapists who were like, okay, look, this person's, you know, got just one foot outside my door. If they go to like a spinning class or just another group fitness class, they're probably going to get hurt again. They really need to learn how to move. So here's what they got to work on. Here are the problems they had before. So I got really good at, at using the original strength resets and some foundational body weight movements to help, you know, really transform people. Mm-hmm. But you're right, man, like having to demonstrate stuff like day in and day out, like and I was lean all the time, dude. That's probably 75% of my clients is just what you described. I'm getting the same. We have a PT that works with us at the gym and he sends people. And then there's another doctor across town. He, he knows about our gym and he sends people. And then anytime Danny does a consultation with somebody, he's like, yeah, let's have you work with Mike first and then we'll bring you back if you're yeah. if you're ready to jump under the barbell or whatever they're interested in. Yeah. And that's, so that's like the ideal thing to have them do really, because I I've told people before, I like by a barbell training, but like the barbell is really unforgiving and, and you have mm-hmm. to be ready to accept the barbell. It's not like the great thing about the kettlebell is that it really works with your body, but the barbell requires you to work with it. It, it does not bend to your will. Like the kettlebell does. Um, that's one of the reasons I love kettlebell training so much is that I, no matter what, condition i'm in I, there's always something i can do with a kettlebell the same is not necessarily true with a barbell like you you really got to prepare for it yeah true yeah yeah um now the uh the the gym that you work at we haven't mentioned its name yet and i want to make sure i name drop it because uh i'm a fan of of your boss danny sawaya so let's talk a little bit about his gym and give it a shout out because of the people who are the people who are listening i want them to visit it like i have not yet visited the the mecca of strength training in tucson yet but i've seen and and heard enough about it to know that that's that's going to be my go-to when i find myself there so tell us a little bit about the place that you work and we'll we'll jump into the next thing yeah uh well it's called tucson strength and uh it's gonna be almost two years now we relocated to a huge new facility uh it's twice as big as our old one we've got everything from obstacle course rig 
plenty of turf, sleds, kettlebells, barbells, powerlifting, bodybuilding. We've got an outdoor training area now. I mean, there's probably not much anything. We have a pegboard. We have a cargo net. Like it's just like a playground for for the strength enthusiast. That's amazing. Yeah. I, I seriously, I'm like envisioning all of these things in my head. I've seen pictures of it. I didn't realize about the obstacle course or the strongman stuff here before, but like to me, that just seems like I would be a kid in a candy store again. Yeah, that's kind of yeah. what it's like. Yeah, and you can pick it. Like, oh, what am I gonna do for this next training cycle? I don't know. Like right now, I'm doing a kettlebell cycle. Yeah. Um, but for just before that I did a barbell cycle and then next is probably going to be a body weight cycle <laughs> that's yeah and it sounds like you got the perfect place for it man like that is really cool yeah it's a lot of fun Tucson strength folks if you are in Tucson even if you're not take a take a trip go to Tucson yeah, if you stop if, if you're an out-of-town guest stop in the front desk and you can get a day pass and uh, come check us out that's my plan again I was I was just telling Mike before we even started uh, recording I was in Arizona earlier this year prior to going to Australia to do some workshops and uh, it was a bummer I wasn't able to make it to Tucson because uh, that was that was high on the list but my my schedule I just couldn't couldn't accommodate it but uh, but uh, yes Tucson strength what is it tucsonstrength.com correct tucsonstrength.com be sure to check it out now uh, another thing I want to I want to uh, talk about that I think is very uh, salient to most people because you talked about working with a lot of people based on you know the original strength resets and some basic body weight and kettlebell stuff. What are some of the things that you yourself had to overcome? And I know you mentioned being uh, having been overweight in the past, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. but like when you started lifting kettlebells and you started doing body weight stuff. Like, you know, I, I talked about you and I have kind of a similar background and that we were, we, we didn't start as being like totally athletic studs. It was something no. that we realized <laughs> later in life, you know, that we wanted to, we wanted to take on. And, uh, you know, I, I've mentioned my struggles in the past. What are some of the things that you came across that you had, a, you found you had a hard time with? Um, oh man. Well, a, I had worked since I had spent most of my, um, twenties and, yeah, most of my 20s sitting at desks, um, whether it was when I was trying to break into the art field or whether it was doing IT. I mean, I had the classic like slub shoulders, no abs, no butt, like just learning how to use all the correct muscles. Um, the kettlebell really helped me wake up my hamstrings and my glutes. Um, original strength was the key to turning on my core. Like that stuff was all asleep at the wheel, um, and helping my shoulders and then the calisthenic stuff, learning, um, scapular retraction and stuff like that. Like you don't realize how bad it is until you're trying to do something and you're like, well, I can't do that. And then somebody goes, well, that's cause you can't pull your shoulder blades back and down or you can't like you know and then um finding smart people that know how to help you fix those things is key like finding a coach i think i mean i coach people but i go to people like you or danny to get coaching when i when i'm stuck i'm like all right i need some help because i can't figure this out on my own yeah i mean same with me um i've uh i've got somebody who's who's written a program that i'm doing right now and it's been very helpful i i I've always thought that it's important, no matter how good of a coach you are, you have to find, you have to get a coach yourself. And I think this is, I, I was able to get by for a few years, like eh, more than a few years, like doing all my own programming. But, um, but I mean, it's, it's a pain because you, you have to try to look at it with somebody else's eyes too. Like, what are the things that I'm missing mm -hmm. that I'm not programming in for myself, you know? Um, and so it's doubly the case if somebody's not a professional, you know, meaning they don't do this sort of a thing for a living. They, they enjoy training. Um, but picking the right thing for themselves to get them to where they want to go without, you know, taking a detour to snap city along the way. That is, uh, that is very, very important. Uh, it's every bit as important for them as it is for, uh, for somebody who does it for a living. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of people, uh, especially, if they've never had coaching, they, there's certain things they like to do. So they do them all the time mm -hmm. and they're either, I don't want to say imbalanced, but they, they run the risk of an overuse injury oh, yeah. or just, yeah. I mean, it's just, I see, I see it sometimes at the gym and I'm like, why, why this guy needs to do some more back work or this guy needs a case of face pulls or, oh yeah, you know? Yeah. Big time, you know, and, and that's, that's another thing you talked earlier about you get to a certain level, like let's say with uh, with karate and you are able to train on your own, 
because you, you know, you kind of have figured some things out. And, and I think that there is something to be said about doing that for, for strength training as well. You know, like you and I both started with enter the kettlebell, you know, and like I did the rite of passage for a long time and it was super helpful for me. So I'm, mm-hmm. I am a big Same. believer. Yeah. I'm a big believer in, in buying programs and following them. Uh, and I think that coaching at a minimum, like it, it's helpful to see a coach at least periodically to check up on you, but being able to follow a program, uh, provided that it has good enough instructions in it uh, and it's balanced enough, I think is, is, uh, is very, very useful for most people, especially if, you know, let's say your schedule or your finances don't, don't uh, at the moment allow you to, to see a, a trainer very often. Right. Agreed. Now, speaking of which, I know you've done, uh, in addition to having done, you know, Pavel's programs and, and some of uh, like Alcavadlo's programs and some of these other, you know, giants, from our niche of the industry. Uh, you've also done a couple of the humble Hebrew hammers programs. And, yeah. Uh, and humble is in quotes because yeah, it probably doesn't really fit the description for me. All the <laughs> way, but, uh, but tell me a little bit about some of these. Cause I really liked hearing about the, the uh, progress that you've made on these programs and you've, you've um, done quite a few. Yeah. I've done a few um, ones that are like, um, ones that I've absolutely loved recently the dawn of the dead bug I really loved that program because it was really easy I mean the the dead bugs aren't easy yeah but it was really easy to do and you could do it every day and you could do it before your workout and uh it was very effective like that I would say that was key to helping me with this last barbell cycle because man I tell you when I go to do my deadlifts it was like my core was just like rock solid like there was no there was never any any chance the back was getting involved with these deadlifts and I was going heavy these were heavy deadlifts and it was like nothing it was all like the deadlift the deadlift was all legs there was no well it was I could feel the abs but I didn't feel any weakness in the abs after doing down in the dead bug so that was that was a great program I would I would recommend anybody when Alex puts that out again because you know he will if you don't have it, grab it. It's a, that's a phenomenal program. Um, I also liked the gay tricks. That was a lot of fun. Again, that was another one of those ones. I like these ones that you can just add on to anything. Yeah. But then I also really like some of your more focused programs. Like I really liked the rings program. So at the time when I got your ring program, I had bought a ring program from another calisthenics guy. And then I had also bought fitness FAQs ring program, which is great, but it's there. His is very hypertrophy based. Mm. Neither of which was like, here's a basic learn how to use the rings with some other extra stuff. And this is the extra stuff that makes the Hebrew hammer program special. That extra stuff are these instructions that help the people that aren't athletically gifted, this guy, (laughs) figure out how to use things like proper scapular retraction detraction and all that and alex's ring program was one of the first ones that had that sync exercise i was like oh this is genius like and you can do it with a number of other implements like i used a barbell and a rack you know pulling on it and yeah. same same sort of setup um and i really liked that and then um you came out with um the body weight mastery and i had missed it i remember looking at it when you put it out like two years ago and I missed it. And then this year I was like, Oh, I got to get on that. And that program was, I mean, still that's my go-to whenever I have questions myself about something with calisthenics, I read back through that. I look at the videos again. Um, It helped me with my one arm push up better than, better than any other one arm push up tutorial. I would say your one arm push up tutorial is the best one that I, for me, right. Other people may have had better experiences, but that was the best one arm push up tutorial I had ever found as far as teaching me the steps and not feeling like I was going to shear my shoulder out of its socket. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that too, because, you know, we were chatting a little bit before, um, before we hit record and, uh, you know, for people who don't know my story again, like Mike and I are like a mirror image practically of one another because, uh, we, I was also pretty goofy and unathletic growing up and not very coordinated. In fact, uh, I went to, they only did this workshop once, which is a real shame because it was, it was a great workshop. It was called the fighters workshop. It was, um, Pavel, the kettlebell King and, uh, Eyal Yanilov, the number one Krav Maga instructor in the world were doing a workshop and this was in California in like 2011. And it was like, you know, Pavel would teach for an hour or so, and then Eyal would teach for an hour or so. And so Pavel was teaching the, the uh, strength and power production 
techniques that you can apply to martial arts. And uh, Eyal was teaching uh, like the actual techniques themselves. So Pavel was kind of doing the, the uh, let's say the, the, the physical uh, preparation sti- side of things. And then uh, Eyal was doing the techniques themselves. And one of the things Eyal did was he had us do some coordination exercises as part of our warmups. And it was like, you know, you had to like jump your feet like side to side and then your hands would have to go back and forth and other stuff like this. And it's like, my coordination was so bad. I was like, kind of like frozen in the, in the middle of the, in the middle of the room, like trying to kind of figure things out. And they all looked at me, he's like, well, at least you're very flexible. You know, like, um, so really when, you know, when I say, for example, that I was, I was uh, not particularly uh, gifted athletically, it, it's no joke. And so I try to take my experiences and put them into programs like this, because uh, as I've, as I was telling Mike, it took me like three years to figure out how to do a one-arm push-up, And so then I, I wanted to go back and record everything that I found that helped me, all the things that, that uh, didn't help me and that are maybe very common that I wanted to, uh, myths that I wanted to dispel and then, you know, put them into one place. So that's what he's referring to when he's talking about this. It's not like some, some uh, let's say, brand new voodoo progressions or something like that, but rather certain focuses that uh, a lot of other programs miss because they're more aimed at you know super studs as opposed to people who are super studs in training agreed and uh, uh i also think you and i both both becoming like uh, obsessed with original strength that that was key in the coordination i i saw oh, yeah. a huge change in my coordination once i incorporated a ton of that stuff especially lots of the the crawling and loaded crawling progressions um and you had the crawl at ace i had that one too that was another great one with all the various crawling i may repeat that this year that sounds like fun you should it will it will be coming back out too because i feel like oh. it's one that i can't uh i mean you've got the at least you've got the 2.0 version right i believe because, so yeah 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 um yeah i think that crawling and the crawl at ace challenge is a great one for people for, kind of like what you talked about like as being an add-on to the stuff that you're already doing because it's not gonna it's not gonna burn you out you know, you're not going to, no, it's great. Like, you know, you, you leave feeling fresh and you leave feeling strong, which is, uh, which is key. Uh, now, when you started doing original strength, I want to do a, a short detour here because you talked about your own uh, improvement in coordination. How did that help your martial arts? Huge, gigantic. So I had, I would, like I said, I found original strength through the strong first form. And it was actually because I was huge, like, I was drinking the Jeff Newbert Kool-Aid. I still do. I love Jeff Newbert Kool-Aid. Oh, it comes in these giant buckets with kettlebells. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, um, I had uh, got his Kettlebell Strong program. Maybe it was right before Kettlebell Strong. Somewhere around, I think it was right around that time. And they were talking about original strength and strong first form. So that's when I read the first book. And I was like, wow, this is pretty amazing stuff. So I started implementing it. And I started watching Tim's videos. And right away, it, it, a huge improvement, especially rotational I was, I definitely wasn't doing enough rotational and that was huge. That improved my roundhouse kick like a hundred percent. Um, yeah. the frog rolls and all the Spider-Man crawling and all that stuff. I felt my obliques do stuff they had never experienced before instantly more power in my kicks now, from that. Now were your sparring partners angry about this, that all of a sudden, some of them were, yeah, yeah, some of them were, they're like, oh, how are you kicking? You're kicking a lot harder now. They noticed. Yeah. Yeah. That's and, but, great- and and just implementing the original strength stuff, I felt like my coordination, my timing and distance and footwork, everything improved. It's crazy, too, because it's like, yeah, your eye hand coordination goes through the roof, you know, mm-hmm. like uh, your ability to see and react to things before you can even think about needing to react to them is like, uh, you know, like I noticed that a lot with original strength. I think that's one of the things, if you're not looking for it, you may not notice it. But if you do anything like martial arts or you play like a sport, uh, I mean, it's it, it's almost like, uh, you know, like bullet time in the matrix. You know, it's like it's time slows down and, and it's like all of a sudden your perception just like enhances and everything seems like it just becomes a lot more, uh, a lot more achievable by having done those things. Yeah, it's good stuff. Yeah, it's super cool. Um, go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say the one, uh, you know, you had, uh, you're re-releasing the gains giving and, mm, uh, yeah. that's a, that's a great program. And, uh, mainly cause I myself don't, um, gravitate towards hypertrophy training. That's not, I don't know why I've never really, I've never really gotten into it, but, um, I was like, I'm going to do this gains giving cause it sounded awesome. 
and I'm so glad I did. I remember when I finished that program, uh, I could easily bottom up press a 24 kilo kettlebell. And I hadn't, I mean, the heaviest I had bottom up press before that was maybe a 20 and it was kind of shaky. Yeah. But the 24 went up like hot butter. I actually got a 28 later, but it nice. was a shaky 28. Um, <laughs> it, yeah, you know, the, the heavier it gets, the shakier it will get. But it, as long as it goes up, man, that counts. Yeah, um, but but it was that that program. And I think, you know, the the reason is I followed it to the letter. You had instructions. You're like, you're going to use this count. You're going to use these exercises. And like I said, I don't normally follow hyper. So it was, that was a totally different kind of programming for me. And it did, it did different good things. And I'm really glad. And I'll probably repeat that again um, sometime soon. Right now I'm running through. I went back to the Jeff Newport Kool-Aid. I'm doing kettlebell strong right now. Oh yeah. Uh, I'm mixing that with a little bit of becoming bulletproof loaded crawling. Oh, and that's basically my program right now. You're going to kill it then because uh, Kettlebell Strong is a great program. I did, uh, I did, uh, you're, are you doing, you're doing the pressing one? Yep. It's called one. Yeah, yeah the base I, one. Yeah. I did that one a number of years ago and I did it for uh, weighted pull ups and deficit handstand push ups because I like punishment. And I was like, I'm just going to see how much of it did I Did you can. just take the programming from it and use it? Yeah. I just did with it. With those. Word for word. Now, I mean, keep in mind too. So I was, this was 2015. So I was slightly, I mean, not significantly younger, but uh, you know, slightly younger. And it was also in the middle of the summer. So it was like, I didn't have a lot of work to do in the afternoon because at, in Israel, uh, at least at that time, it was like, I always had a lot of work after the high holy days, meaning like after um, uh, Yom Kippur, things would start to people would start to want to come back and start training again. And then it would be like that all the way through spring and then the early summer. And then around then people were going for vacations and they were gone for a while. And so my, my, my schedule usually lightened up a bit. Um, so I would go to the park and I would just be like, I'm just going to, you know, set up and I'm going to be really leisurely about my training. I'm not going to have to rush through anything. So I would go and, you know, bring a, bring a kettlebell with me, bring a couple of encyclopedias, like old Hebrew encyclopedias <laughs> so that I could elevate my hands. Right. And, um, yeah. And it was amazing. Like, uh, it, it works like a charm. The, the one thing I would have done differently at the end of it, meaning after having completed the program would have been doing a muscle building, uh, protocol right. because it would have perfectly solidified all the gains that I had, that I had made. And I just didn't know enough at the time to know that I thought, well, I'll just recycle it. And then I, I found, I just couldn't keep it up. Cause it was like, you know, I, my body just needed a change. And, uh, but yeah, I, I really think that cycling between really like absolute strength focus, like uh, like a program like Kettlebell Strong, you know, from Jeff or, or any of these other uh, really great programs like that. And then a muscle building one. I think that just really gets people exactly what they need. You know, like it gives them enough of a break from going really heavy, but it builds up their structure well enough that they're able to do stuff like you talked about, you know, doing a bottoms up press with a, with a 24, there's no bottoms up pressing and, and, uh, gains giving at all. So it's like mm. six weeks of not doing anything like that. And all of a sudden, like you're getting better at stuff. You're not practicing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It worked really, it worked amazing. And, um, and it filled me out in a couple of places. It was good. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I really liked the one, um, I had not spent a lot of time doing it. The, uh, floor press with the bridge. I really yeah. liked that. I mean, I, I, I use that with my own classes now. It's a great accessory lift. And it seems like you're not doing much, but it's really effective. It's really effective. You know, one of the things, I'm glad you mentioned that because I, I first learned about this. I mean, I knew about floor presses be from before, but I was like, yeah, you know, like you're kind of restricted in the range of motion. It's, it's not the same thing or like a push up or whatever, but, but the, adding the bridge to it, I think adds a lot mm -hmm. to it. Like it's, I it's, get, I get so much um, pec major activation with yeah. the bridge part, and I feel like doing it with kettlebells as opposed to a barbell because the offset weight of the kettlebell, like I feel like that adds so much feedback into the arms and the chest in that lift. It's it really effective. Yeah, big time. Um, I've I've done it with a barbell. I think doing it with a kettlebell, you feel like there's something you feel in the pecs where it's like they just mm -hmm. lock in. And, and, and like, you just, you, you can't let go, you know? Um, and the, not, the really nice thing too, is that there's some kind of, like, I think a psychological level, uh, of trying to jump up to a heavier weight. So if you can, if you can work on pressing a heavier weight, even if it's a totally different press, like the bridge floor press, 
um, you know, by the time it comes to uh, wanting to press something heavier overhead, you're like, well, you know, I've already, I, I can already do like sets of eight with a couple of heavier bells, you know, that I can only maybe press for one or two reps overhead. It just doesn't seem psychologically like it's such a big deal anymore. Like you're ready to tackle it. And uh, it's just a matter of, you know, putting in the work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that one, that was a really, um, cause you had options in the, in the gains giving and I took the floor press option. Cause I was like, you know what? I've never really played with this lift. I would say if there's one detraction to that lift, it's the initial setup of getting one oh, kettlebell yeah. on one side and the other. And if you're using big kettlebells, they're kind of unwieldy. Like, okay, okay. And you got to lock yourself in, but then once you start pressing it, it's all good. Yeah, that is true. I mean, and that's why I have kind of like the, I, I, the unique setup to do it. So it's like, you kind of do the get up style thing mm. to get one in place and then yeah. you have to do this kind of awkward curl for the other one. But if you have it set up correctly, like it, yeah, it's not so bad, the leverage works in your favor, but but nevertheless, yeah, that, that is one uh, thing about the lift that is tough. Once you get past it, though, like you said, it's like, you know, you just feel like you're pressing like a mountain of weight. Yeah. And it feels good. It's it's a it's a good it's a good feeling press. I, I never had any like um, injuries or any any discomfort. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the nice uh. thing, too, about pressing at that that kind of angle is not only is it something that we don't really get much of, so it's really going to help, you know, like you said, fill out some areas that uh, that might not otherwise get the attention that they need, but it doesn't seem like it's all that likely that you're really going to get hurt doing it. You know, like, it's not like military press is super likely to hurt you, but I know people who've had some issues with the military press, like shoulder starts to bug them or neck doesn't feel so great, but like floor press, I think floor press along with like push-ups and stuff like that, you can really do quite a lot with it before you're ever going to run into any, any issues. Uh, so it's, it's a, yeah, I'm with you, man. It's a great lift all around. It's a big bang for the buck exercise. I also like, you know, you, you get the, if people who, people who are not familiar with this, I, I have a video on my YouTube channel. You can look it up, but, um, but the bridge part of it, like you get your glutes engaged big time and your legs yeah. and everything like that. And so learning how to kind of get that sensation and then applying it to a military press or, or other types of pressing is, uh, it's a big, huge help. Yeah, it might be. I mean, I don't, I haven't tested it with anybody, but it might be a really good accessory to help people with their bench press too, because getting the glute activation in there. I, I kind of get the feeling it would be I, it, uh, as an accessory lift, you know, like if you got a barbell, obviously you don't have to worry about like the stability challenge between each side, but uh, with a kettlebell, it, it's kind of like, you're going to hit some muscle that you wouldn't otherwise hit. And you're going to see too, like, is one side doing a whole lot more work than the other? Like I know mm -hmm. Dan John is a big fan of um, one one arm bench press, and I think he usually uses a kettlebell. He's got like a. I think Mark I think Shropshire does the same lift too. Yeah, yeah, and and it's very smart. Mark Shropshire, for those who aren't familiar, he's uh, an original strength instructor, very smart dude. Um, he is one of the one, he, he Tim Anderson and then Chip Morton, who's a. Uh, he was a strength and conditioning coach for the Cincinnati Bengals. He's also a very talented uh, coach through original strength, put together OS Performance. And they've got this incredible workshop that uh, I highly recommend that you attend. And, and they each of them bring something different to the table and they make it like this, this like trifecta of amazing when you go there. It's like, I think a six hour, eight hour workshop. Um, I, I was like drinking from a fire hose, like they say. Yeah, and they have it. You can... Uh... You can buy it. Uh, they've they've done a virtual one that you can buy, like a oh, seminar cool. that you can buy and watch. I might have to buy that then. I didn't realize it. Right. I, I knew that they were going to do that. I didn't realize that they'd already. It's on. Already it's on the it. website. Yeah. Yeah, that would be. I might have to do that just because I want to. I have the manual, uh, but I don't have the the video to go back over. That would be perfect because that was such an amazing workshop. Um, and like I said, they each bring something new to the table. All very very smart, like high level coaches. Um, and so if Mark Shropshire says it's good, you know, well, he and Dan John, like to me, that's like, right. That's close, yeah. you know, how do you argue with that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's uh, it's not even an opinion at this point. It's an actual fact, you know? So, uh, but yeah, the, it's, it's a great, great movement. Doesn't get a lot of, uh, doesn't get a lot of press because people like to, you know, do the, the overhead work and stuff like that. But some of the other angles that you can use a kettlebell for are, are primo for getting super strong. Yes, sir. So as we get ready to wrap things up, um, what are, uh, let's say, some pointers that you might leave people with who are in a similar situation to where you were when you got started? You know, like 
either uh, looking to become more physically active or maybe even making this a career or even kind of like a side gig that they do on a routine basis? Um, well, I, I'm going to borrow a line from Dan John. One, just show up. Mm -hmm. So what worked for me, uh, I, if I worked all day, I wouldn't work out after work. I would be fried, exhausted, yeah. make excuses. Um, for me, what worked best was uh, first thing in the morning, uh, I would get up, get dressed, take my dogs for a walk, and then it was it was my time to train. And I knew if I put it in the morning, it was done and I could get on with my day. I'm not saying you can't do it after work, but if you're one of those people that constantly says, I'm going to go to the gym after work and you don't make it to the gym after work, maybe try going to the gym first thing in the morning, make, get up earlier. Do you make it part of your schedule? Mm -hmm. It's got to be in your routine. Even if you feel like not that great that day, just show up. You never know what's going to happen. Sometimes those days you just show up, something cool happens. Oh yeah. Um, you know, Get with somebody to help you figure out if you're if you're really big, you have to figure out your eating. That's the priority. There's there's no amount of cardio in the world that's going to strip the body fat off of you, other than learning how to eat better, more natural whole food, mm -hmm. um, not processed foods, not fast foods. And you know you're gonna probably have to make a food diary for a while to keep track of what you're what you're doing, because then then you know, right? Success leaves clues. Uh, most people that are are in really great shape physically, they know what they're eating almost all the time. Like I, you know, Danny, I know Danny keeps track of his food all the time, and he's in phenomenal shape all year. Yeah, that dude's um, bad man. I uh, I'm more of the lazy food tracker, so I use intermittent fasting, and so I just know I'm like, okay, I fasted 16, 18 hours, I can within reason, eat what I want, as long as it's not total garbage. And right. so, man, I try to eat a lot of uh, protein, vegetables, um, non-processed carbs. I don't, dr I don't drink any calories except for the occasional beers on the weekend. Mm -hmm. Like during the day, all I drink is water and black coffee. Oh, man. Um, and then if you can, I mean, honestly, I think that the biggest spark for me was finding a hobby that was physical that I really like to do. It, and it doesn't have to be martial arts. It can be soccer, basketball, something you enjoy physically doing, gymnastics, uh, handball. I don't know. Pick something. Go, go find something that physically lights you up, water skiing, something that makes you excited. And I think that you will see how your strength training can improve that and we were made to move as a species. We were not made to sit all day and the sitting all day is for lack of a better term, killing us. Yeah. Right. I mean, most people that sit all day have a lot, a lot of issues. Um, but if you move a lot more, I'm not saying you have to move all day long, but you know, make it a point to do some movement during the day. And, and if you haven't do some original strength, watch a couple of videos, read the books, find a coach, once you learn a couple of the exercises, you can incorporate it in your day pretty easily. Yeah. Yeah. I really with you on that because I think that it's so easy for people to, uh, to overthink it and, um, and think that the only way they're going to make a difference for themselves is if they are like, they dive all in like people right. kind of discount the, the, uh, the little things that you can do daily that have a huge impact. Like if you just make it like on my lunch break, you know, uh, I'm going to walk for, you know, 10 or 20 minutes. And it just right. every day, like by the end of the week, you know, when I was still at the IT job um, and I started doing longer and longer fast, I wasn't eating lunch. <laughs> so that's what I would do on my lunch break. I would walk. I would just yeah. go take a walk. And I'm sure that, that you probably started to notice some pretty cool stuff, like in a, in a short period of time. Yeah. Well, I was getting lots of vitamin D. Um, I would always feel it would, I wouldn't feel like garbage by the end of the day when you work eight hours in an office sitting in a chair most of the day only getting up to drink more coffee run to the bathroom or you know talk to somebody or whatever but you spend the majority of your day sitting it just exhausts you in a way that i i can't describe unless you've unless you've had the same kind of job it, it's very true i mean i i haven't experienced that personally but i have worked with a great number of people for whom that was the case and it's like uh there's almost a leap of faith that you have to take in not taking massive action I'm, I'm a big believer in this and not taking massive action because that's what everyone, and I'm not saying it's bad. Some people can do it and they, and they do great, you know, and sometimes the, the situation warrants it, but so often people are like, okay, I'm going to go to the gym an hour every morning, 5am right. 
for right. five days a week. And it's like, dude, you're going to do that and for they two weeks. burn out in. Right. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> I see it all the time. Uh, yeah. I remember uh, Fabio Zonin, who's a master instructor for Strong First mm-hmm. out in Italy. Uh, one of his, um, this guy, I think the guy's his business partner now, um, but uh, he started off, he, he sold computers to, to Fabio and he asked, he asked him like, I want to get in better shape. You know, what should I do? And he said, okay, do you, how often do you drink beer? He said, every night. He goes, how about just drink beer like three nights a week? So he's like, okay. So he took his, he took his advice. He started to notice he was getting leaner. He was feeling better. And he's like, I want to start lifting kettlebells. So he showed him, you know, swings and getups. And he's like, just do it two days a week. So he, he just did it two days a week and he was feeling better. He's getting leaner. He's getting stronger. He's like, I want to do a third day. Fabio was like, not yet. Just stick with just the two days. Right. So he, he tempered his, his, um, uh, his ambition so that he didn't get ahead of himself. And he kind of gave himself something to work toward and, and something to be excited about being able to do. And the ability to do that really helped transform this guy's life. Cause now the dude is like total stud, you know, he's, uh, he's significantly leaner than, than what he was before. He's a lot stronger. It goes a very, very long way to help you. If you, if you're willing to take it slow, that doesn't mean, you know, you don't do anything of value, but it does mean that you start by doing the things that are not going to be emotionally draining on you. And then once that becomes old hat and it's super easy, like let's say you're doing 20 minute walk at lunch three days a week, then maybe you start doing four days a week. You know, mm-hmm. you, you don't try to crush yourself doing it. And then you take this and you build a, a little by little on each little thing that you've done. And before you know it, you have a stack of accomplishments. You have a, a sense of confidence in your ability to take action. And uh, all of a sudden, these big goals that you thought you could never do, they don't seem so out of reach anymore because you can see all I need to do is keep stacking one little thing on top of the next. Right. And I'm going to get there. Yeah. I mean, I, I have some people ask me about the weight loss and I said, well, I didn't lose 100 pounds in a year. Like it took yeah. years. It was 297 and then 287 and then two. And I mean, it was probably a good five years till I was down to about 225. Mm-hmm. And it was around that time that I found Kettlebell Strong and Original Strength. Oh, maybe no, I found that a little bit later. Let's see. It was 2000. It was around 2011 when I found uh, some fasting information and um, that along with the Kettlebell Strong and whatnot uh, accelerated it um, and then training for the Strong First Cert. So by 2015, I was down to one, I was at my leanest. I was down to like 178, but I think I've gained muscle since then. Like yeah. it was like, <laughs> um, but it, it took, it took many years and it just took like little, it was baby steps. It was first, okay, I'm going to stop drinking soda and I'm not going to drink beer every day. Just like that guy's story. I own, yeah. I own myself. Even now I only drink beers on the weekends and not, I limit myself to a few beers. I don't want to, you know, get loaded and uh, gain a lot of weight either. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, it's certainly possible to lose 100 pounds in a year, but uh, the the peril that people forget about is that your body likes homeostasis. It's not, mm-hmm. it doesn't exist for you to be awesome. It exists for you to survive. <laughs> so it's not going to try to do everything it can. It's not going to like get in the way of you doing things that are perfectly within your ability, but it, it's also, the, the, you, have, you run the same risk of you getting, let's say too strong, too fast, quote unquote. I mean, you can make some really huge gains in a short period of time, but often the kind of programs that, that do that are the ones that you're going to find like, you know, you'll make a huge gain and then you're, you're going to kind of drop back to where you were before. And the same thing goes with, uh, same thing goes with, with uh, weight loss is you might lose a whole ton, but it's, it's also very likely that you'll bounce back. So slow going is a much, it's mind numbing. It seems like at times, or at least for pe- for this is how people perceive it. But you never, you never ballooned back up another hundred pounds. You know, you were steady with it. You stuck with it. And uh, I mean, you, I think you said you're what, like 190 something now and you're mm-hmm. muscular, you know, you're lean and uh, you're crushing weakness all the live long day. So you're going to get five <laughs> years older anyway. So you might as well do it so that in five years, you're like the best possible version of yourself. Not the guy who's, you know, trying to go to bat right. again uh, for the fifth time doing the exact same thing that got him into the position that he's in now. Yeah, I just try to think a little better each day. It's the way to be. Yep. Absolutely. Little and often over the long haul. It's another Dan John quote. <laughs> He's got a lot of good ones. Yeah, you could. 
we could just sit here and rattle them all off for hours. I'm sure. Should. I should just <laughs> invite him on the show so that he can do it so that I, you know, so I don't have to take my word for it. You know, well, Mike, where can people find you online? Cause I want people to follow you and, uh, and see all the cool stuff that you are doing. Um, tucsonstrength.com a website for the gym you can find my bio there you can also find me at originalstrength.net uh, if you search for my name there i don't have my own website um, oh, yeah. if you're in tucson you can come by tucson strength if you want to get a, a session or come check out the gym that's where you can that you find me i definitely yeah. recommend that people do it because uh like we said it sounds like a like a paradise for people like us. Yeah, it's it's a really cool place. It's it's definitely and it's changed a lot of people's lives here in Tucson. Absolutely. Definitely. Well, I look forward to uh doing that in person. Mike, thank you very much for being on the show. Thank you, Alex. It's been a blast. Pleasure's been all mine. And folks, as always, have fun and happy training.